Numbers chapter number 14 for our time of preaching today. Uh, as we always try to do on these special uh, days of, of recognition and, and uh, whatnot, we always want to uh, lift up a passage of scripture that can both speak directly to uh, our uh, targeted populations of fathers, but also <clears throat> invite all of us uh, who are here uh, to, to feel some kind of direction and some benefit uh, from the word of God. It is uh, worth uh, noting today also that it is uh, the, the day of acknowledging Juneteenth, and this is the first year where Juneteenth has become a national holiday. And uh, for, yes, yes, let's thank God for that. For, for many of us, uh, you know, Juneteenth was one of those days of celebration uh, where you didn't necessarily require uh, the, the, the country to be the ones to, to, to cause us to celebrate. Uh, it was one of these, uh, these uh, um, holidays that became a, a tradition and a regular part of our experience as uh, descendants of those who were enslaved in, in uh, this, this American Western uh, slavery trade where uh, on 1865, literally, we were notified in Texas, in a city called Galveston, Texas, that of uh, freedom and, and liberation from the tyranny of slavery was extended to uh, enslaved Africans at that time. And all of us, most of us, many of us, uh, have such great connections to uh, these kinds of experiences and communities all across the country. It's so interesting when you think of, uh, particularly we who have been in California for quite some time, uh, all of us uh, who are here came from a southern city. Uh, you know, this is so fascinating when you listen and, and remember and look in through your heritage uh, and you realize that the, the way that lots and lots of black folks ended up in San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley was because after uh, slavery was over and as they kind of, you know, dealt with the immediate 30, 40 years after slavery, you know, black folks down there were tired of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> Somebody say amen. They were tired of Jim Crow and Jane Crow. And so many of them said, you know what, we're going to get on this train. And we're going to ride this train till the train run out. I <laughs> said, I'm getting as far away from Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas and, and Alabama and, and, and Louisiana. And so black folks got on the train and the train ran out of track right at the Port of Oakland, what's now called the Port of Oakland. And they said, okay, this is this, this as far away we can get from these folks. So <laughs> we're going to get off this train. Literally, this is what happened. Y'all laughing. This is what happened. And they got off the train and they started to set up shop in West Oakland. And then during the war, uh, all these jobs were made available uh, as the country was making all the, the, the military equipment. And so the Bayview Hunters Point community and the West Oakland community became a, a destination spot for jobs. And so folks came out here to work at the naval shipyards. And, 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 and they set up all these housing, uh, uh, federal subsidized housing to accommodate the workers and everyone that was coming. Why is all this important is because what we often may take for granted is there is always a story behind your journey. And when we don't take time to acknowledge the stories that have produced us, then we will often lose uh, sight of how valuable it is, not only that you're still here, but you will also lose sight of the lessons that help to bring you over. Um, my father always taught us when we were growing up that you know we have a responsibility to break cycles, cycles of, of dysfunction and cycles of trauma and cycles of behavior that are often a part of our journey that we may or may not be fully cognizant of. And so today we're going to uh, bring this sermon uh, to the congregation. I preached it, you know, maybe some years ago, uh, but it, it dropped in my heart as I was thinking about this moment we're in because right now as we are trying to catch ourselves as a country, as we are, you know, enduring these hearings that are happening in about January 6th. I don't know how many of you are watching these hearings and you're watching and seeing how, how, you know, how we misremember 
the, the, the parts of our country's history greatly influence, I believe, the, 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 the tragedy and the possibility that we will fall into uh, a lot of pain and trauma and bondage if we just had a better memory, if we had a better commitment to not re-inscribe some of the things that we in our times past, God gave us a pathway out of. And so November chap uh, Numbers chapter number 14 is going to be how we're going to try and talk about this today and, and, and even uh, allow you and I, perhaps, uh, whether we're fathers, whether we are mentors, whether we're just good old folks who are trying to stand in the gap, how can we be most faithful in this time? Numbers chapter number 14, verse number 17 through 24. And this is what the scripture says. God is speaking. Um, uh, uh, to the, the, the children of Israel. I'm sorry, Moses is speaking to the children of Israel right after they have received the law from God. And so Moses is trying to help them to understand their responsibility to make sure that they stay faithful to the God who brought them over. And while, you know, it may be, you know, it's kind of assumed that this is important. How many of you know faithfulness to God uh, is not something that you can ever hear too much about as a reminder? Amen. Particularly when there are moments where we are constantly being invited to be faithful to other things. So Numbers chapter 14, the scripture says, Moses speaking, And now I pray thee, let the power of the Lord be great, as thou hast promised, saying, that the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But the Lord will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of fathers upon children, upon the third and upon the fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray thee, according to the greatness of thy steadfast love. And according as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even unto now. Verse number 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly, as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of those men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I wrought in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the proof these ten times and have not Hearken to my voice. None of them shall see the land which I swore to give to their fathers, and none, none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Uh, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Come on, let us say thanks be to God. Amen. So we're going to take a few moments to just preach from the, the topic, we are cycle breakers. Amen. We are cycle breakers. Amen. God bless the word that has been read for the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you, and please allow your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and even the hearers of your word, and we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Come on, make it personal. Say, I am a cycle breaker. Now, the book of Numbers is, again, one of these uh, original five books of the Jewish kind of holy text. They call it the Torah, which just means that of all of the scriptures that the Jews hold to be dear, when Jesus was talking about the Bible, when Jesus was talking about the word of God, Jesus was talking about the Torah, that the Torah, the first five books, they served as a historical record of God's covenant journey with the children of Israel with the Hebrews. When 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 you talk about the Torah, you're talking about the kind of origins, God's theological kind of treaties, God's description of God's self-revelation. You're talking about the struggle of the children of Israel, kind of moving from the original Hebrew from Abraham all the way through to, to, to Jacob and Esau, and then to Joseph, and, and then all the way through to Moses, you have an uninterrupted record 
of God's activity with a particular people. And throughout the Torah, you find other people groups kind of, you know, thrown in there, right? But they never become the center of the story. Why? Because the Torah is intended to help uh, 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 reveal, to help articulate, to help make very clear that God had a commitment. God has a commitment with real people over time. That if they, sometimes, you know, if you tell a story and the story has too many characters in it, you know, the, 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 the story usually doesn't have as much power in, you know, inherent in, in the way the story's told. Any of you ever went uh, to a movie and the movie didn't do enough character development? I mean, you, you sit in there and you feel like, you know, I did not get an emotional connection with this character. It kind of happens when, you know, uh, they, they have like these superhero movies. I mean, Avengers did a great job, but it took them, listen, almost 20 years to tell the story of the Avengers to the point where you'll have an investment in each one of the characters. I mean, you know, my, my daughters, they love Avengers and stuff, and so, you know, we got Disney Plus, so you can watch all, literally all 20-something films. Amen. All like back to back to back to back. And I remember watching the first Iron Man film. And you know, I remember when Iron Man first came out, I was like, man, this is this is man, this is the greatest story ever told, you know. Like the 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 the, the technology, the the special effects, you know, I was like, whoa. And you know, because I'm a I'm a comic guy, I appreciated that they could do a lot with this whole you know, group of stories, but they had to take time, literal time and billions of dollars to weave a story that would eventually net billions and billions of dollars. Well, I think part of what I want you to appreciate about the Torah and about why it's so important for the, 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 the story of God's self-revelation to the world to be understand and appreciated through this particular set of actors and actresses and characters in the book of, of the Torah is that God is constantly revealing God's self through a particular people. Why? So you and I can understand that God is concerned about the intricacy of your journey. God is not just a parachute in God, just popping in and out of your life. God is someone who wants to sit with you when you succeed and when you fail. Somebody say amen. When you hurt and when you heal. When you're winning and when you're losing, God is there with you throughout the course of your life. And that's such an important truth to appreciate. Why? Because there will be moments in your life where you may play a different character. The trajectory of your story may have some highs and it may have some lows. And when you take a look at the passage, Moses is very aware of the kind of fickleness of the people that he's called to lead through this season. Moses is like, now, you know, I was minding my own business, uh, uh, Yahweh, uh, Adonai, you know, all your many names. I can't even say your name. I got to make up names. I was all right. I was out here in the, in the wilderness dealing with some sheep or some goats, and all of a sudden, you the one that came interrupted my life with this bush on fire, praise God. I was, I was happy, amen. I wasn't trying to deal with these folk. You ever had that experience? God, I was okay. You come knocking on my door, giving me this assignment, giving me this cross to carry. I don't need the cross. I'd rather just be crossless. <laughs> Moses very much aware that God had given him an assignment. And so Moses' immediate response to the assignment was to intercede to intercede on behalf of those whom he was called to lead, to be responsible for. And in the first uh, part of the passage, Moses, knowing the character of God, at least as he understood it, Moses understanding if these people make me mad, you know, 
then God, I know you must be, you must be dealing with a lot of emotions up there in heaven. Uh-huh. And so Moses starts off by saying, Lord, please, you promise you'd be slow to anger. Interceding. You would be abounding in steadfast love. Interceding. You'd be uh, someone who is forgiving iniquity and transgression. Interceding. That Moses understood that the whole life of these folk is going to require mercy, grace. It's going to require space for them to make mistakes and opportunities for them to experience restoration. That part of what it means, I think Moses is trying to help not just himself, but remind God in these kind of moments of, of, of transparent conversations is that, God, you know, uh, as I lead these folk, the only way that I can lead them from where they are now to where they need to be is if you give me the space and them the space to be fully human. Mm. Okay. To, to not... To not be, uh, 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 as the scripture says, uh, uh, quick to anger. <laughs> Amen. Like me, praise God. Not, not, not to be petty. Like me, praise God. Not to have the memory of an elephant, as Brother Clay Thompson said in the press conference. You know, holding grudges. No, God, I need you as you're dealing with this fickle, this, this, this idiosyncratic group of folks to remember your promise that you would be slow to anger. You would have steadfast love. You would forgive their iniquity and transgressions. And child of God, I want you to know that this is one of the most important roles that we have as fathers and parents, as mentors, as adults, even as children, even as, as, as young adults, that we must be people who are constantly aware that our role in our relationships, in our uh, uh, positions of authority, is to be an intercessor. To stand in the gap on behalf of those who you are called to be responsible for. It is to extend to them what you know has been extended to you throughout the course of your life. And I know that for many of us, we weren't extended a whole lot of mercy and a whole lot of grace. And so that's why our grace and mercy fuse is quite short. <laughs> but how many know I am a cycle breaker, praise God. Part of your task, part of our task is to, is to lengthen the fuse. So we don't reinscribe the same shortness that was given to us that did cause us to have and internalize so much ill will towards our own humanity. When God is actually has extended more grace to you than you could ever exhaust. I mean, that's why they wrote that song, Amazing Grace. I want you to know that song was not written by somebody with a short fuse. <laughs> And I know some of us, you know, it's like, you know, oh, you know, you know, we, we need judgment. No, you, you think you need judgment. Amen. But I want you to know that everyone who's calling for judgment just don't understand how that judgment could be turned back on them. Amen. I'm, I, I remember when, I, when I, 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 I used to go stand up for all the young people in court, you know, when it first came to Berkeley and we was, me, Pastor Nisha, all of us, we was at the high school and we was dealing with all the knuckleheads and, and they, you know, all of they rob folk, they shoot folk, they, 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 they do kind of things and then they get in front of the judge and they cry out for mercy. And I say, that's right. Don't give them what they deserve. <laughs> Man, give them mercy. Why? Because everybody should have an opportunity to learn from their errors. Everybody should get an opportunity to, to redeem themselves. Everybody should get an opportunity to break a cycle or two in your life without be permanently locked into a position of straight up punitiveness and punishment. And child of God, I want you to realize that part of our goal, part of our task as followers of Jesus is the first part, we are to seek pardons. 
We ought to be people who are able to stand in the gap on behalf of those who literally are susceptible to the whims of judgmental, punitive systems and individuals. Standing in the gap, seeking pardon, is one of the great tasks of fathers, of mentors, of, of, of adults, of, of individuals who understand that your worst mistake ought not define the totality of your life. And, and you know, I, I want you to know that for, for many of us, this may feel like, you know, because in our society, there's, there's a lot of punitive sensibilities in America. You know, America's one of the most judgmental nations that can't take no judgment upon itself. <laughs> Man, marry me, oh, you ought to, you, you ought to, you know, you do the crime. You ought to pay the, pay the time. But can you imagine if America had to pay for its sins? You want to talk about a multiple life sentence up in here. Amen. if there was no grace for America, then, then how many of you know this whole country will be swallowed up in the earth in a free fall? Hello, somebody. But there's no special grace that's given to America. It is reflective of God's nature. As Moses said, God is slow to anger. You ought to, you ought to, you ought to thank God that God, God, I thank you that you slowed to anger because, you know, now, some of us know the things we do that are deserving of God's judgment. I'm not talking about the, the, the churchified stuff. Because, you know, we got our list of church sins that, you know, feel more worse than other sins. But all of us have a conscience. All of us know the things we do when nobody else is around. We know the resentments we harbor. We know the mean things we, 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 we the games we play. Somebody say amen. We know the vindictiveness, the Machiavellian kind of schemes and manipulations we want to do when folk don't treat us right. Uh, can, can I get a witness that you know yourself? Somebody say amen, right? And don't you want whoever is out there that's meeting out punishment to just understand that you're human. <laughs> it's like, God, I, I know I want this person gone, but I, if you just give me a week to get over my anger, I, I want them around again. <laughs> Anybody ever had that kind of sensibility? It's like, in the moment you was upset. But, but after a week, after some time passed, you were back into a moment of intercession, of pardon seeking and I want to invite you beloved to ask yourself how do we seek God for forgiveness and restoration what responsibility do we have as we're interceding to also invite healing and reconciliation for ourselves and those that we've harmed and those who have harmed us you see, part of the task of seeking pardons is to realize that even though we may not be able to have the same kind of relationship we had, I'm not going to be bitter towards you for the rest of my life. Whenever I come in your presence, I'm not going to be grinding my teeth. <laughs> I'm not going to be punishing my children because I can't get along with their, my counterpart. I'm not going to be on my job, you know, uh, modeling. You know, sometimes parents show up to schools and our kids are watching how the parents interact with the adults at the school. Hey amen. You know, I, can, I know it can be tough, amen, because some of these folk, hey amen, they, they, they know how to bring the worst out of you sometimes. I got all kinds of stories, hey amen. Me and Sharice having to advocate for Sarai and Nyla at the school. And I sat in offices with principals and I've had to remind them of how full of the devil they are. <laughs> Amen. But I had to do it in a way where it was not an occasion for my own children to disrespect them. So it's even in how you advocate has to also maintain a certain level of respect so we don't raise children who don't understand the structure and order of things. Because how many know for some of our kids, if they don't understand the structure and the order of things, we have done them a disservice. I 
know there's all this new stuff out here about everybody just be free and, you know, figuring out on their own. But I want you to know sometimes folks figure it out on their own and they end up in the grave too soon. That's why the scripture says that we ought to train up our children in the way they should go. Amen. And then, you know, it depends on what kind of training tools you use. Amen. Some of us, we've been trained so hard, and man, it's like I can't wait to be free from this boot camp of a life. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But the whole point is, part of what it means to break a cycle you must seek pardons. You must intercede. You must seek out healing for your families, for your children, for your communities. The, 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 the cycles don't break without a, 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 a robust, overflowing presence of forgiveness and healing. You don't break cycles unless you have the capacity to forgive and, 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 and reconcile and do some healing work in yourself and with others. Woo. Oh, you ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I got to seek some pardons. I got to seek some pardons. Uh, the, 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 the second thing that I want to lift up is, is part of what it means to break cycles is we must identify generational sins. Mm, somebody say generational sins. Verse number 18, the scripture says that the iniquities of the fathers are often born upon children to the third and the fourth generation. And all that means is if we don't break cycles, we can pass down all kinds of things that, that, that you know you was trying to run away from. Uh, I mentioned, you know, how, 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 you know, folk in, 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 in Arkansas and in Alabama and in Tennessee and, and Texas, they ended up out here running away from racism, white supremacy, Ku Klux Klan, vigilante violence. Only to find out when they got to Oakland. <laughs> can, can I give y'all some history, praise God? When they got to Oakland, the same cops that was cracking their heads in the South. Literally, I want you to listen to this. The governments of the Bay Area literally hired officers from the South to come police the blacks in the Bay Area. That you could be running away from things only to realize that they waiting for you. You didn't even know it. If we don't break cycles of violence and trauma and pain in our communities, just running away from it is not the answer you seek. Admittedly, sometimes the most you can do is put distance, right? That is a wonderful and a necessary temporary solution. But how many of you know the, thing you, the things we run away from often require a breaking of a generational bondage. And the generational bondage may not always be something you've invited yourself. And this is the great problem of America, is America has a generational challenge with white supremacy and racism. So rather than trying to break the cycle of racism in this country, what does America try to do? Oh, we just try to elect a black president. Ooh, okay, thank God we did that. All right, racism is over. Come on, black people. It's over, so let's just, let's just move on. Literally for eight years, everybody's talking about a post-racial society. I used to tell some of the progressive groups, if anybody wants a post-racial society, black people do. Somebody say amen. So I'm, I'm not, we ain't hating on, on what you're saying, but our eyes are not, they're, they're not telling us that your declaration is true. And then lo and behold, what do we get? Donald Trump. We was running as a country, running, running, trying, and all of a sudden you run right into the very thing. Why? Because we refused to address the generational sin of racism. Now that's a macro example, but I dare you to look inside 
and think about your own family dynamics, your own personal journeys, your own trauma, your fear, and your pain, and ask yourself, am I running? Or am I dealing? Am I running away, hoping that my legs can be, you know, my stride? I got, you know, these strides. I'm making strides. No, God is not just asking you to be a runner. God's asking you to be someone who can identify and break the cycles of trauma. And I want you to know, child of God, that some parts of your life may be an easier time to do it than others. But this is why, again, I love the scriptures because they give us a historical record of God's, listen, thousands of years of commitment with God's people. That identifying generational sins, listen, if it's going to be visited upon the third and the fourth generation, then guess what? Even if you can't do it in your life cycle, God says, I'll still be with your generation in their second and third and fourth generation. The best thing we can do as followers of Jesus is to keep telling our children and our communities and our families about the God that brought us over. I know people are post-religious right now. You know, everybody's feeling like, you know, uh, it's, I, 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 don't, I don't have to believe in God. You know, I can believe in myself. That's fine. But, but I want you to know something. That time has a way of introducing God back to the non-believer, to the skeptic. And that's why I don't argue with people about some of these matters. Be like, God been around a lot longer than your agnosticism. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay. I did a podcast with some folk the other day, Tremaine Lee, and I said, you know, my and our theological beliefs ought to always have enough space for the humanity of those who don't share them. Amen. I know what I believe, but just because I know what I believe don't mean that I got to, like, force you to believe it. What I believe ought to have enough space for your humanity, for you to be safe, for you to be loved, for you to be provided for. That is the expanse of what it means to follow the ways of Jesus. Amen. Folk be arguing, well, you know, do you believe in the Trinity? Yes, but... That, that, what they got to do about you having a house to live in? <laughs> I'm going to say, man, you going to take communion? Yes, but what does it have to do about you not being shot down in the street? Hello, somebody. That the generational sins must be addressed. And so I want to invite you, child of God, take seriously generational sins. Fathers, take it seriously. My dad sat us down. He told us all about our generational sins around uh, promiscuity, around uh, alcohol and liquor. Amen. Now, I'm 46 years old, and I still don't drink. Amen. Amen. I can't speak to my siblings, praise God. I can talk about myself. Someone asked me, why don't you drink? I said, because my father told me that alcohol and McBride men don't mix very well. And I believe him. Said, I got enough vices. I got enough stress. The last thing I need to be is to become a wine bibber, as they used to say. Because I think I would like it, praise God. <laughs> Mikey likes it. He may like it a little bit too much. <laughs> then I have another problem, another, another, another devil to get off my back, praise God. How many know you already got a whole bunch of devils on your back? You don't need no extra ones. Why? Because generational sins, I take those things very seriously. I want to believe, child of God, that you are taking your stuff seriously, that you go to therapy, that you sit and talk to some folks, amen, who have no uh, investment in your response, right? You don't, you don't got to be acting and, and performing, 
You ain't, you ain't got to be lying to them to, to preserve some sense of your own, like, like, you know, positional grandiosity. You ought to talk to some folk who can tell you that your stuff stink. But you better work on this. That your leg is broke, you thinking it ain't. You dragging that leg around, what's wrong with your leg? Oh, nothing. <laughs> nothing wrong with my leg. You know, just a little sleep from time to time. Oh man, you got an injury. Ain't that something how most of us men, we, 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 we the last one to admit we got an injury. I was speaking at the March for Our Lives event and I was talking about how so many of us in our country, we are a traumatized country. We just came through the greatest pandemic in our generation in 100 years. We've lost hundreds of thousands of people to death. We've had millions of folks experience a long-term COVID. We're watching wars in other countries. We got mass shootings and interpersonal shootings. We have high rates of, of, of sexual assaults. We got unhoused folk all around us. We as a nation are drowning in trauma. But we in the church, unfortunately, we have stigmatized trauma and we have stigmatized therapy and healing so much that folks think that the only thing I got to do is just come to church. I can pray. I can cry. I can do a few little, you know, religious things or I can I can puff, puff, pass it away. Now everybody's self-medicating themselves and you're burying the trauma under all of this self-medication in church and in the streets rather than stopping for a moment. And saying, how can I be well? I mean, ain't that what Jesus told the brother who was laying there by the pool of Bethesda? He asked him, do you want to be made well? Lord, help me to preach in here today. And I'm here to tell you, some of us, God is asking us that question today. Do you want to be well? And how badly do you want to be well? Are you willing to break a cycle in order to be well? Are you willing to throw away a habit in order to be well? Are you willing to move differently in order to be well? And I'm here to tell you there's a benefit to want to be well. Uh, that's why in the book uh, of, of Numbers that we read in verse number 24, God told uh, 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 Moses, he says, that all you who won't deal with your stuff, you got a ceiling on you. You, you came out of Egypt, that's a great thing to celebrate. But God says, the promised land, you can't get there. Right? Because the promised land requires a new you. You can't bring your, 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 your former bondage self into this new place. So you may find yourself stuck in a rut and stuck in a cycle. God said, I'm not going to kill you in your cycle. God says, because, you know, I'm always going to give you the chance to live out the life that you've chosen. But I believe that there's a few of us up in here who don't want to stay in a cycle for the rest of for the rest of your life i believe that god is calling a few folk who believe that the promised land is within my grasp the promised land is a destination i prefer i know what it's like to live in egypt i know what it's like to live in bondage i know what it's like to be surrounded by my oppressor by my vices by my deficiencies and i'm glad that even while i was there god sustained me god kept me god did not let me fall god did not let me die but i have some eyes of faith that have me looking a little bit outward have me looking a little forward for my family has something better for my relationship has something better for my children I got a vision that will not allow me to stay in bondage in this cycle so God I pray that you would do for what you did for Caleb you do it for me give me a different spirit Give me a different heart. Give me a different mind. Because there's something more that I know I must do. And this same old spirit is not enough for me to take the next.
next step. But God, if you give me a different spirit, I know that I can make it into the promised land, into a healing place, into a restored place, into a better place. I believe God. I got to break the cycle of addiction in my family. I believe God. I got to break the cycle of abuse in my family. I believe God. I got to break the cycle of violence, of intimate partner violence, of interpersonal violence, of cheating and hating violence. I got to break the cycle because God, I am a cycle breaker. God, I am somebody who wants to please you. Shout hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet, everybody. God, give me a new spirit. I want a new spirit, God. I want a new spirit, God. Verse 24 says, because Caleb has a different spirit and has followed me fully. The promised land. Yes, Lord. Your destination. It can be within your grasp. Now hear me, I'm not trying to minimize the pain and the struggle of the relationships you have with your fathers, with your parents, with your children, with this social context we're in. But if I could use Juneteenth as a metaphor, The enslaved Africans were free from slavery long before the soldiers showed up to tell them so. They just didn't know it yet. Word hadn't arrived to them yet. What if I were to tell you that freedom from your generational bondage is already a reality for you? This just may be the first time someone has told you about it. Someone has uttered the words that the pain that visited you or your family years ago, decades ago, need not be the pain you carry into your next life. That's why it's important to make new holy days. Juneteenth is important. Pride month is important. Father's Day, Mother's Day, all the why? Because we're trying to make new memories to undo some of the damage hmm? that may have been done in your life before. And I want you, child of God, we got these big days, but now I want you to make your own day. Hallelujah. Make your own day. This was the day I said, this is not going to define me. This was the day when I said that, that, that dysfunction, I'm not going to carry this. The shame, the burden, the disappointment. I'm a, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't this, it's too heavy for me to carry this forward because I got a different spirit now. Whew, lift those hands. Lift those hands. Lift those hands. Hallelujah. Create in us a clean heart, oh God. Hallelujah. And renew the right spirit within us. Wash us, God, and we shall be clean. Why, God? Because we want to be right. We want to be whole. We want to be saved. Somebody say, I want to be right. Come on, say it. I want to be whole. I want to be saved. So God, do it right now. God, I set this day, hallelujah, as my own personal liberation day. Just like my ancestors were told that they were free from slavery. I'm hearing a word today 
That is telling me that I'm free from the generational curses, the generational sins, the mistakes, the burdens, the shame that I've carried in silence and in, 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 in hiding. God, I'm not going to allow this stuff to, to weigh on me, God. If I got to cry, I'm going to cry it out. If I got to pray, I'm going to pray it out. If I got to get some therapy, I'm going to go get a therapist. If I got to do better exercise, if I got to read better books, if I have to listen to better music, if I need some new friends, God, I am today going to make a decision that I will break this cycle today, God. I will not allow the cycle to continue at the expense of my own soul, my own spirit, my own mind, my family, my children, my community. I will be a cycle breaker. Come on, somebody should say that a few times. I will be a cycle breaker. Say it. I will be a cycle breaker. I will be. I will be. I will be a cycle breaker. And so, God, we who need you in the pardon of our sins, Lord, we who need your forgiveness, we who need you to to, to wash us clean from our transgression. God, I ask for forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness. God, we accept your gift of salvation. Lord God, come into our lives. Make us brand new and give us a clean heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, hug two or three people and tell them we are cycle breakers. Come on, hug two or three people tell them we are cycle breakers. God bless you people of the way. We love you so much. We love you, we love you, we love you. Thank God for you being here. Thank God for hanging out with us on this Sunday. I want you to know, child of God, that our lot is to break cycles. Our lot is to start anew. No matter where you are in your journey, how many glad we can always start anew? Woo! We getting ready to go. Stay standing. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna dismiss and 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 give y'all a chance to take your your significant loved ones to brunch or, or or walk the lake or or go home and take a nap. Praise God. Amen. But whatever you do, let's be on fire this week about breaking cycles. I mean, let's be on fire for the rest of our lives about breaking cycles. Again, I want you to know that there is never an expiration day for you to break a cycle. Amen. All you got to do is make up in your mind today, this will be a different day to break some cycles. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Praise in this house today. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, people of the way. We love you so much. We thank God for you so much. Amen. We are just so blessed. Amen. To see the saints coming on back into the house of the Lord. Amen. We trickling on back in. God bless all you that are uh, watching online. Amen. We, we're just glad to have these moments and spaces where we can continue to gather in person and online. So that as we become more comfortable and more freed up in our schedule, let's, let's keep gathering because I believe there's a blessing in the gathering. There's a blessing in the gathering.